Hello, and this is PAX Chapter 17. Pax watched Gray's lap at the river's edge, then stumble back. For two days now, the fox had, had, had rusted across from the Warsit camp, but Gray had not gotten better. When the old fox reached the spicy shade of the hemlock bough, he collapsed. His eyes were hollow and glazed, and he barely flinched when Pax cleaned his neck once more. Pax read the wound even more. Hello and welcome to Chapter 17. Pax watched Gray lap at the river's edge, then stumble back. For two days now, the foxes had rested across from the war sick camp, but Gray had not gotten better. When the old fox reached the spicy shade of the hemlock bough, he collapsed. His eyes were hollow and glazed, and he barely flinched when Pax cleaned his neck once more. Pax found the wound even more inflamed. Stay hidden. Rest. He left Gray and climbed upstream to a place he discovered where the bridge, where the river narrowed beside a gorge wall, and the underbrush beside it was dense enough that he could move about unseen by the humans. He had little luck hunting. The area was teeming with mice and rabbits, but they scampered from Pax's clumsy attempts to catch them. Besides beetles and unripe berries, he'd been able to swipe only a few crayfish, which Gray had refused. For half an hour, Pax tried. He chased scurrying voles and hopping wrens and once a sunning frog, but each time he sprang, his jaws snapped around the air only. He grew hungrier with each failure. He wanted meat for himself and his weekend companion. The rich smells from the camp tormented him. He leaped into the water. The current was swift there, but midway across, three boulders rested against one another to form a secure perch. From there, Pax had a clear view downstream to the humans. More had come. A few were women, but most were men. Pax checked for his boy constantly because his father was still here, and because he sensed that his home was not far away, but only full-grown humans appeared. Many of them were in the field now. Some were down near the river bank, unrolling wires directly across from Gray, which made Pax uneasy. But the soldiers didn't seem interested in anything except their labor. <coughs> Pax had learned their routine. Each morning, two of them entered the tent that his senses told him was full of food. Then these two would cook at the fire, and the other war sick would gather to eat. Afterward, they all toiled in the field and the vehicles, unloading more and more machinery. But no one went near the grub tent until dusk. When the two would cook the evening food and then call each other, call the others to gather. It was mid-afternoon. Pax watched a while longer to be certain that the war sick were occupied, then crossed over the remaining span of rushing water along a fallen tree. Belly to the ground, he made his way across the ridge to a spot above the old mill. There he paused to survey the, the scene. Three men were positioned at the encampment just below him. They huddled over new equipment on the south edge of the mill, where the two thick walls met. The rest of the humans were in the field. Some rolled spools of wire to the holes they dug near the riverbank. Others lowered boxes into these holes, then shoveled dirt over them. Two pairs had crossed the river. They were digging holes on the far bank, some directly below the hemlock where Gray was resting. Pax knew that the humans would not scent Gray and that Gray would not venture out near where they were. Still, he bristled in anxiety. He would move the wounded fox to the safer place tonight. Pax darted to the north edge of the mill ruins near the tents and vehicles. There, a perch tree angled out from the stone wall. Pax stopped short. He had been there before. This place. The tree with the peeling white bark. The, the walls. The field below, scented with wild onions and timothy grass and faintest odor of tar. He recognized them all. He had been here long ago with his boy, as a kit. The scene returned. Sticks. Peter and three other boys had rushed each other from these stone walls, whooping and brandishing sticks. They'd been laughing, but those swinging sticks made Pax uneasy. 
He shadowed Peter, yipping at the other boys when they came too near, until Peter had tied him to this very tree. Pax had whined and chewed the rope the rest of the afternoon. Peter had been here. Pax sniffed the tree and the base of the wall thoroughly, but he could find no trace of, of his boy now. The war sick men, though, their scent was everywhere, strong and dangerous. Pax's gut tightened. He checked the tents until he was certain there was no movement around them. Then he made a dash for the grub tent. At the corner, he paused, checked again, and slipped under a flap. Inside, meat hung above tables heaped with onions and potatoes. A bonanza for his taking. Pax sprang and seized a joint of a ham, tearing it from its hook, and darted out of the tent with a heavy prize in his mouth. He ran hard uphill behind the walls and back through the shrubby wood. At the river, he dropped the ham and gulped down a meal of the salty meat. He tore the joint apart and buried two large hunks in the sandy soil at the river's edge and then marked the caches. He picked up the remaining piece, lush with meat and fat that would nourish Gray for days, and carried it over the fallen trunk. He paused in a pile of boulders to survey the camp again. The humans had disappeared. A new odor. Faint but menacing hung in the air. Pax recognized it. When he was a yearling, the father had brought a fan to his boy's room. Pax hated the electrical scent coming off the wire because between the fan and the wall. One night, when the odor was especially dangerous, Pax had chewed through the wire as if killing a snake. Pax's every instinct urged him to run for the menacing scent, but he wouldn't leave without Gray. And just then he saw the old fox stagger out from beneath the hemlock bough, making his way back to the river. Gray tripped. Instantly, the scorched air smelled sizzled up from the spot like an earthborn bolt of lightning. At the same second, the riverbank exploded. Soil and rock and river and turf blew up in a furious roar, then fell back to the crater and earth like harsh black rain. Pax dropped the ham and barked for Gray. His ears rang in a shuddered silence. The war sick poured out from behind the walls. From their cries, Pax knew they were excited. They ran down to the field, splashed across the river, and spread out over the smoking bank. After several moments of searching, they made their way back to camp. When the last war sick had returned, Pax tore down the gorge. The great, uh, the great hemlock bough lay across Gray's chest cleaved from the tree. Pax's, Pax nosed his friend's muddy cheek, pawed his flank. He sniffed Gray's muzzle. There was breath there, but just barely. Pax lay down shoulder to shoulder with the old fox, pressing tight in full company. He could offer only withness, but nothing else was asked. Linked with Gray's final memories, he heard the song of an arctic bird instead of the human shouts. Instead of the ha ashy haze that hung over them, he saw with gray, a vast blue bowl of sky. Instead of laying on the gridded ground, he tumbled with gray and his brother Kits across a snowy tundra spiked with starry blue flowers. He purred with gray under his silver mother's rough tongue, tasted her warm milk, felt the weight of her chin rested over his newborn skull. And then peace. The old fox was still. Pax rose. He pressed his forehead into the friend's cheek. He reared and bayed and bayed, heedless of whether the warsick heard them. And then he ran. There was no joy in running this time, but there was a relief that his body served him. He ran and he ran north through the dusk, north through the night. As dawn crested, he entered the challenger's territory, but he still ran. The yellow fox charged out to face him, but he fell back from the determination of Pax's course and let him pass. Pax galloped down the cliff, tore across the ba valley bottom, and strained up the final long rise to the meadow. Midway, he stopped and lifted his head. Three fox watched him approach. Three foxes watched him approach. They were familiar to him now. Gray's mate, still big-bellied with kits, runt half her size nearby. Bristol did not stand with them. Her bright fur shone at the base of the large pine that towered over the meadow, the pine under which her sister had died. 
The sense of Gray's death was on Pax's fur, but the foxes knew already. Pad padded up to the rest of the way. When he reached Gray's den, he lifted his head and wailed the notes of grief. Three foxes answered in kind. Gray's mate approached. She sniffed Pax's nose and then his flank. She learned of the fight, which did not kill her mate, and of the human's explosion, which did. She learned also that Pax had protected Gray and fed him and cleaned his wounds, for which she was grateful. And then she learned the news Gray had died trying to obtain. It is not safe for us in the South? It is not safe. Gray's mate walked away, her belly swaying. His message delivered. Pax dropped to the grass, exhausted. Runt came to claim the space beside him, and Pax was glad to allow the little fox to groom him. Bristle watched from the base of the pine above them. Pax slept fitfully through the afternoon, plagued by dreams in which his boy was tangled in smoking wires. Finally, as the moon rose in an indigo sky, he got to his feet. He breathed the sense of the foxes linked in grief over the loss of their silver center. He was linked to them by the same grief and he knew he would be welcomed in this valley if he chose to stay. But his dreams urged him back to the war-sick camp. As he was about to leave, he sensed Bristle tearing down the hill. He waited. Where are you going? Pack shared his new understanding. The exploding earth was war, that the wires caused the death. He shared his fear that the boy might come upon them if he joined his father, and his determination to protect Peter. These explosions, they would kill humans? Yes. She sprang around to face him. Then leave them. Pax ignored her. He gathered himself and leaped. He hit the ground at a run. That is the end of chapter 17.